Okay. Very good morning to one and all. So welcome to the session on data structures, algorithm, and design course with title uh, with the course code SSG519. So in the last session, we started with this asymptotic notations, the importance of asymptotic notation, and the one who has actually invented them. Um, uh, can, can anyone answer me the question who has actually invented an asymptotic notation? They answer that question. Oh, I, I, I forgot to ask you that question. So you just uh, you have all the freedom to use Google when I have certain questions when I ask. Uh, okay, why is this not audible? Okay, yeah, fine. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. So if you see it's Edmund, actually, it's Edmund who has actually introduced the asymptotic notation, and it's the Donald, uh, it's the Don E. Kunu, who is the person who has actually did a lot of research and implemented the asymptotic notation in the day-to-day -day algorithmic design. Okay, so uh, so th these are the people who actually invented. Uh, uh, Edmund is the one who actually invented the asymptotic notation and highly usage was done by Donald. Actually, he has written a very famous book on called uh, Algorithm. You can see Algorithm 1, 2, 3 series, which is considered as the best book in the world for algorithm here. It's a complete guide, okay? So now, in the, in, uh, those were the people who actually invented and we discussed there are three types of asymptotic notation. The big O notation, which talks about the upper boundary, then we discussed about Theta notation it talks about the closest tight bound or average, and the third one is the lowest boundary where we will represent the omega notation. Uh, so these were the three notations which are uh, which are very popularly used in time complex calculation or representation of a time complexity. In the previous session, we have also discussed about how to find the functionality equation using primitive uh, primitive uh, operators where we have used very important uh, primitive operators like signing expression and all this with we try to calculate the uh, function functionality equation or what you say is it the time taking equation and based upon the equation we could always compute the uh, upper boundaries of a time complexity using the big o notation where we discussed about uh, big notation with respect to to drop down the lower values and dropping the constant multiplier. This we discussed. Apart from that, okay. Apart from this, apart from this, we also started with some generic rules. How to calculate time complexity when I uh, use certain generic rules when I write an uh, algorithm or a program. So, right. So, in this last section, we started with loops. I'll again restart with the loops, the nested loops, and the if else condition. Then, if it is a logarithmic value, how are I'm going to use my time complexity? And we'll reach visit all the three same problems what we did and apart from that we'll do one new problem after that we will move to the master theorem which will take 20 minutes for the explanation if you have any questions i am requesting you please do post at the end of each topic so i'll wait for the question so then we'll have the discussions right great so in the last session when we were discussing there was a big confusion between a lot of people who were calculating the operations sequence wherever it is also loop. Now I'll talk about loop. See, forget about what we learned in the last session for a minute. For To understand each topic individually, then we will combine all the knowledge that we have gained in the time of examples, right? Okay. Now, for example, you have written a program where is, there is a particularly a loop. Using, uh, let's say, for example, we have taken for loop in this case. Now, the time taken to run for this for loop would be simply, I, you can, by looking at, you can 
and at the time taken the order of n for the for loop yes no or n times the for loop getting executed you will you will agree with that statement because uh, i have to do comparison and then i have to increment every time that at least that statement is i am going to run it for yet now what happens is apart from that there was no braces saying that uh, in the programmatic way we write in detail about how where the loop has to end and the loop end but when we are writing this <clears throat> what do you call pseudo codes we might not be giving so importance to the braces right now what happens after the for loop there is a constant which is m is equal to m plus t it's a simple assignment of uh, the additional operation and then assigning op so it is going to perform the particular statement in constant time yes or no you agree that you will agree that yes it's going to perform in some constant time that m is equal to m plus where for and i'll take some constant time and assigning the value to m i'll take some constant that's clear. so if now what is total complexity of this program big question when we are writing these are primitive operators just calculate it now when i write how do i write the question is a big question someone will say n plus c let's say n plus c that's the problem this is not a sequential program for an instance remember i'm just talking for the loop if it is a sequential step by step program what you have written is correct that n plus c is a correct answer but unfortunately we are discussing it as a loop when we consider okay when we consider this as loop what happens is i have entered into my loop and i'm performing some uh some task which is part of the loop which is part you mean to say i have not kept the bracket but after this there is a addition operation that is also happening okay right so one second let me add the ink <clears throat> I'd like to put the color right. Okay, great. Okay, so at this point we had used the. This is very thick. Let me change. Okay, so uh, so uh, it might be little all uh, well, that. Okay, okay. This equation so agreed that is going to run n times. absolutely now what happens is work for m is equal to m plus 2 you are agreeing that this particular operation is going to work it go, is going to perform with a constant time that is true that's clear now someone has written an answer the time taken for whole this program to run is n plus c which is wrong someone would have said i am taking n plus c to for this uh, sorry yes. this this is which This is n plus c. Okay, someone has said this is wrong. Why I'm saying you is what happens is look. This is a loop. What happens is the far end m is equal to m plus two are part of the loop. So m plus two is part of this loop. So I perform n times into constant. Remember when it is loop, you're not looking it as sequence. You're just looking it as n into c. So basically, you can even think as from internal to out so i'm having a constant time c which is part of my loop so i have i am in the loop that's why it is c into n or n into c so the time taken for this whole loop is the whole loop is now someone will be saying are you going to n plus 2n plus nc no that okay now uh, i have a very interesting someone is talking about the whole time taken for this should i write no since what happens is the whole time taken to this can be something like 2n or 2n plus 2 nothing we will only take the upper bound of this particular for that is n so it is n only n only so the total time taken is so the out the for loop is executing n time so that way it becomes order of n now you are clear for a loop okay i and and remember and remember one thing see we are talking with respect to only time complexity with respect to worst case worst case is the case where 
I can give at max the possible input or the largest possible input in that scenario only I'm talking. So whatever input you are giving for this program, it is saying that with respect to your input size, my output will only take time to perform. That is order of n. So if you give for four elements, it says taking just four iterations. If each iteration is taking one second, it says four seconds I'll run this program. So that's why it is saying order of n. As your input increases, the time taken to perform this task also increases. Okay. Ah, okay. Now someone says, now let's say accidentally, accidentally here I have written, okay, sorry, here. so when I have to activate a note, it might take, okay. Someone says, sir, I calculate this portal together and I'm getting something like 2n for this statement. What should I do? See, if you are getting 2n, even if someone has accidentally written 2n into c. Now what happens if this is 2n into constant time is again 2n only because constant part we don't. We are going to drop constant. So again it becomes n. So that's why it doesn't play an important role. Should I write 2n plus 2 or should I write only uh, n? So that's why we are for easier thing we are writing n. Okay, got it? So no confusions at that point. Even if you write at the final time you are going to drop the constant, so again, it will be simply written order of n. Okay, got it? So let me go for the next uh, example, next uh, rule, that is when I'm having nested loops. Uh, so this is clear how we are, we are in loops. Loops are not sequence programs. Loops are program within the program. That's why they doesn't act as loops. Okay? Okay. So now let's go to the We'll go for the nested loops and now in nested loops I think you should always remember a factor of something called internal loop to outer loop. Always when you're calculating the time complexity, assume that you're starting from the internal most loop to outer most loop. That's more important. And you have to consider the total time running of all loops together. Not one loop, all the loops together. Now here I have already given an answer, I'm sorry, but let's see how the loops are run. The first thing in your calculate, actually your program will run from top to bottom fashion, but for easier understanding, we are making assumption that the program, uh, we try to calculate from internal to out, into out, okay? So let me quickly finish that. So the first constant operation that you see here, here is A is equal to K plus 1, right? You agree? Do you agree this is the constant operator that is running? K is equal to K plus 1? Yes, you agree. So let me since okay. So let me come out. Uh, let me in from internal. So it is single, which is inside a loop. It's inside loop. Now after this, what it is run? It is running the first for loop, right? The internal for loop. How many times it is running? N times. Constant into n. I after you exit this loop, there is one more loop which is running. So if you see program inside program. So the outer program is running now which is running for n times, right? So that's why if you see, c times, I'm running the inter constant for c times, then the first for loop n times, then the next for loop for n times. So that's why it becomes constant into n into n, that's why it is total constant n square and the time complexity is order of n square. Okay, now someone says this. Uh, see, e e uh, See, even if you say the internal loop, loop runs for n minus 1 time and outer loop also runs for n minus 1 time. See, I'm saying the word n times because I don't know whether 99 or 98, both are numbers. That's the reason why we were talking with respect to n. Okay, just that's the reason why I'm saying n time. Even if you say my internal loop is running n plus 1 time, I can use simple, but easier simplification you can take. You can see it has n times only. Okay, got it? Uh, so I think, uh, Nishit, your uh, answer, you, you will get the clarity in the next uh, topic. Don't worry. Okay. So this is clear how it is order of n square now. Huh, see, whatever, see, whatever, let it be the increment or decrement happening, that is not what we are interested. 
We are saying here how many times this loop might have. Now I have a question here. Uh, for your con if you understand, I have one simple question. Let's take there is an operator which is trying to compare. I is equal to one. This is a comparison operator. Now these are not sequential. Please, please, yeah. please do not get confused. These are looping concepts. Sequential concept we'll just see in the next slide. Okay. Uh, see, what happens is when you are writing time complexity, let's say you have got an equation like n plus 1, what is the time complexity of n plus 1? Still you will write odd of n. If your complexity is n minus 1, still you will write the same time complexity is going to take order of n. Just try to explain why they are same, why they are not same. I'll just try to explain you with a simple example. Why they are same and where you are getting up. Okay. Let's say there are n numbers. Okay, n numbers. Just simply type one n number that you like, that n is equal to sign here. Just n number you can just type, someone type. Someone has 50, someone has told 50. See, your n is the size of input, which is n for someone it is 500, for some it is 100, for some it is 50, right? You agree with that? You agree with this case? So when your input is being given, you are saying my loop will run those many number of times. Yes or no? Now what happens is, when you are going for n plus one time running of the loop or n minus one time running of the loop, total all with respect to your input, those many times it is running. That's why n minus one, n, all comes into the class of n elements. Okay, please don't get confused. Someone says uh, order of n minus one. They never write something like order of n minus. They always try to write this belongs to a set of input size. So it becomes order of n, which means with respect to input, my program is going to behave. Okay, so for some n input or n minus one, at max one time run will depend and it will differ only by millimicrosecond, which is negative. Okay. What you are saying is correct. You are saying n plus one time running is one out one, n minus one time is 99 run, that's agreed. But we are generically putting in a class. So class of input, n is none other than class. That's why if you write order of n, it is understandable that it is going to run for n times. Okay? Don't worry. Don't worry. We try to keep the calculation simple. If you say, no, let me say n minus one and n minus one, Ultimately, you might end up getting 2n or something, but we will just try to ignore. Okay? Right. See, j into 2 is a different concept here. Now, someone had a very beautiful question. Okay? Just someone has a very beautiful question. Uh, Anil, you are wrong because you are partially correct, but you are wrong adding at the constant. Constant, I have told you again. This constant, one second here, let me activate the note. Okay, let me activate for a second. What happens is this is completely par one part. Okay, this one part. So I start C first. After C, this is one condition exit. So that's why it is C into N, not C plus. And this is not a sequence. This is a loop. Okay, got it. So this clarity you'll get in the next uh, slide here. Okay, so now that's, I hope I'm clear. And now someone had a question. Instead of writing order of n square, can I write order of n m? Now you can write, but it is always advisable to write order of n square or order of uh, m square, not writing in the terms of order of n into m. Okay? So that's correct, but still you have to write in order of n square to avoid ambiguity. Ah, for loop, it is always we try from inner to out here. You can write, that's what I'm saying. Someone say, I, can I write order of M, N? Yes, you can write what it happens is size of input M and size of input N. But unfortunately, in this case, if you see the input size is only N. We are not using two inputs, M and N. That's why you should not write order of M, N for this program. 
when you have two input sizes you are correct order of mn you can write but for the same single input you will preferably write order of n into n or order of n square got it if you have two k see cases in the sense what i'm talking is for two program two inputs that is what i was talking with respect to mn okay right Ah, uh, so there is a question of j is equal to j star two that you will get clear in the logarithmic. Just wait here, okay? Okay. Now let's try to look at the sequential way how people are trying to solve a problem when it is sequ. See, sequential way and non-sequential are two different. Okay. Now, first of all, before going to sequence, what are the statements that you are feeling they are part of sequence? Just try to answer them. Okay, or I will raise the question each statement by statement. Then you try to answer. Do I consider x is equal to x plus one is part of the sequential program? Yeah. Okay. So what is the time taken to? Run? I have already mentioned it is constant. Now come that it's clear. Now come to the first for loop. Do you find for and m both a sequence or a loop here? This two, this two together. Look great. What is the time complexity that you find now? Please do not say. Uh, okay, someone had a very interesting question. So let me. So, how many people are not feeling this as part of loop here? Some people might feel these are also see. How many people are finding that? Let me look at that. Uh -huh. So yeah. Okay, so why are you assuming that you are in sequence is because there are no brackets, right? But remember, this for loop and m are part of it. Whenever you get a for loop, the next immediate execution state should be secret. Now I understand because there are no braces, you got confused. But when I write a protocol, we try to avoid brackets as much as possible. But if you are getting confused, have the freedom to put the brackets. Here, okay. Yeah, you have the freedom. Don't worry. Don't get confused. You just put the bracket for yourself so that it makes your job easier. Okay. Now, the time complexity for these two steps would have been c into n. Got it? And this is some constant operator. Now come to the next two for loops. What is the time complexity that you would have made assumption is c into n square? Right? Got it. Now if you see, we have got three parts in the program. Yes or no? How many parts you are able to see? Now you will be saying, I am able to see three parts. Now what are those three parts? C, C A N, and C N square. So write it in an equation form. Why? Because these are three parts that are going to execute in a sequential manner, in a sequential manner. So your equation for this will be C. However, you can write C plus C N plus C N or C N. Square. So I'll write in the C N square plus C N. Plus the order. This will be the equational form when you have sequence. See, they are sequentially. That's why c plus c n plus c n square. Now you got how I am doing the sequential addition. You got it now. Now show me what will be the time complexity. See, multiplication is only done for groups, not to the sequence. Please. Now in this, now someone say. Can't I write order of n or can't I write order of one? Should I write order of n? See, there is a general rule. Whenever you are having an equation that is f of n functional equation, in that you always drop the lower order. The lower order is c n plus c, so you can drop the higher order is c n square. So your time constant and even after that's the first. Rule. The second rule you have to drop the Constant multiplier. You can drop even this. Way. So the left out is n square. So the time complexity for the worst scenario is order of n square. Is that clear? I hope I I am clear how to do the sequential addition. So whenever I talk to sequence, it is not line by line. All loop targets or the loop should be performed first. Then you should do the addition to the parts of the code. Got it? Okay, uh, we know uh, uh, we will do one thing. When there is a break, I'll try to explain. Yes, only I will not wait. Okay, let me go to. Okay, how n square? Uh, you know that's what I told you. Know we'll just have the discussion. Okay, great. Yeah, let me go to the next slide where we'll 
discussing about self condition and then okay okay that's a very good question one which i would feel i would like to answer right now someone said my equation is n square plus n right would you agree with my statement actually the equation is n square plus n plus some constant value but constant i mean now should i write order of n square plus n should i write this or no no they are giving me an answer correct no but some people are saying this i tell you why not okay let's try to define graph this okay i think most of you have not viewed the recording pictures on uh, time complexity so don't worry uh, but i'll just try to design a graph and try to explain you the notation then you'll get that clarity okay so if you have uh, in fact we'll just uh, discuss that for a minute and then we'll this is your input and size and this is the time taken to execute okay now what i have a equation which says n square to n plus 1 let's take this the simplest possible format of the other equation is this okay okay now can n plus 1 will be at any time will be greater than n square at any time with any input you give n to be 100 n to be just look at two parts n oh great answer okay i have to put one more condition where input is then equal to okay fine now i think uh, you have the answer oh, that's all where is greater than a uh, one year not like input size is we are talking larger input notation see what you are is with respect to uh, with respect to the uh, lower bound but talking about only upper because it's notation okay okay now this k n ties to like n square will other than n one okay okay so n square is always greater than n plus one. what happens what we are trying to say for in given input after one Cause after a certain time, nothing can grow greater than n square. What is after a certain time in this particular equation? After a certain time with input, nothing will grow greater than n square. So your graph will be with respect input. It will be growing. Sorry, it will be growing. One second. Let me bring back the position. i'm just trying to add to this because okay what happens is your graph grow exponents this is a functional graph of n okay now what happens is after some time it will not it is not going to behave weirdly than any input n square so that's what we are going to only the top bound n square okay that's the reason why we consider order of n square rather than order of n got it so with a larger input for a given time with n square input it might grow exponentially that's the reason why we always take n square as top notation rather than writing order of n square plus is that clear or any confusion the yeah, maximum top bound will take okay if you graph for n something else if you graph for one so you design for one one will be linear and the n will growth will be not exponential it will be constant growth but n square will grow exponentially so i'm trying to say even if it grows exponentially with respect to big o notation after x square n square it is not going to grow any more so one it will be linear when you take n input it is going to go constant but n square from exponential which is the worst case. that's why always take n square got it with respect to this case only we are talking. okay now let me talk about this i have explained so there is no ambiguity if else sorry in yesterday session the if else uh, tpt i have made certain statements so that's why i am again discussing about if else statement okay so let's uh, have a look at if else statement in if else statement do if and else will run at the same time 
have a question. Will if and else will run at the same time? Definitely no, right? Okay, no, great. Now what happens is any one of the statement, either if statement will run or else statement will run. Okay. Uh, you 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 are correct. What you're trying to uh, write here is correct. Uh, so what we are trying to say, f of n will never be less than. No. It won't be greater than n here. Not less. It's greater. Okay. So we'll just discuss about your question uh, afterwards. Case statement is uh, case statement. What is is a switch condition. So it will run. Will enter once and only one statement will go. Uh, switch statement I got it. Okay. Here. I got some other um I'm just missed from if statement. Let me back this. So I, I had a question. Whether if will run or else will run or both will run together, yes. If a statement which one will run? Only anyone, right? Great. Now let's say we get two time complexity for if let's it is order of n and for else let's say the time complexity is order of n square. What will be the total time complexity of program? What are you making a guess? So one is order of n. If statement is saying that the time taken to run statement is order of n, the time taken to run L statement is order of n square. So what will be the total time complexity of, of your program? Why are you not saying order of n? Why are you saying order of n? Why are you not saying order of? Why? Because when in if a state, we will always try to describe the worst case. Worst case here. Do not say max, say the worst. The probability is with some input L statement can get trigger and it will run for n squared. And that's why I am taking the worst case scenario of order of n. If state is if it is always true, I'm I'll be able to run in order of, but still your program you are talking with the worst. That's so why when you search for any program, you get fifth condition. Worst case, worst case, and average case. Now, what will happen in this program if someone wants to ask you what is the best case of this program? For example, you will always try to say which is running the smallest. If a statement is it. if is running with constant time, else is running with order of n time. The best case you will be staying is with respect to theta notation of 1. Okay, got it. No, order of 1 will not say. The moment you say big O, it becomes the worst, worst case representation. You will use the word mega, mega notation. Remember here, it's omega of 1. Got it? So what happens in real life is we don't use omega and we don't, we try to avoid omega. We majorly use only two condition that is big O notation or theta notation. What is theta notation? Even with respect to any input, let it be the best input or worst input, I am behaving the same way. I mean, no, no upper bound, the upper bound and lower bound are so cl closely tightened, then I will always represent theta. This representation is familiar in recursion program. In most of your recursion programs, when you see divide and conquer, they will try to say in terms of theta notation because divide and conquer are so closely bounded with upper bound and lower bound. That we'll talk later. Okay, till I think I'm clear with if else statement. Okay, got it. So can I, I'm moving to the next uh, discussion that is logarithmic. Okay. So let me go to the logarithmic time complex. Before going to logarithmic time complex, have a look at my example where I am not increment a program one by one and incrementing it by some constant multiplier that is i is equal to i star two if the input is n let's say input how many of my elements will totally be visited by the for loop all n will be considered or some portion of n will be considered that's my question for the program example sum is you are saying the n by two is okay some portion Technically, half, half, right, great. Now, now, 
Okay. Now I have a question. If I put k square, what will be the element n here? Anyone guess me? What will be the element n? If I put some called k, what will be my element? So you get us, sir, we have no idea what is the input. But input is here and some input. One of the elements of n you will at k, yes or no? One of the elements, right? Some element you will have at the k, yes or no? Okay, I'm repeating my question. Let's say your loop has run for some steps. Let's say that step number k. Now, your n should also be associated with some number. Yes or no? What will be that number as per your Yes, it should be some power of 2. Correct. Okay. So I'm at k step, so 2 to the power of k will be the value of the n, right? Yes or no? It will be 2 to the power of some value for the k n, right? Yes or no? Would you agree with that? 2 power k is equal to the, because I'm at k step and my division is, my multiplication is happening with 2. So I should be at 2 to the power of k, if I'm at k step, 2 to the power of k will be the number. Yes or no? That's what I have written. If I'm at k step, 2 to the power of k will be the sum number of m coming out of the loop or if it is the last iteration, right? Now that's clear. Now if I apply logarithmic at both the sides, log 2 to the power of k is equal to log n. See, remember, I, this k log 2 is a part of a log x to the power of y can be written as y log x here. Okay? Y log x. So y log x you can just simply write k log 2, which is log of the matrix. So since I'm using base 2, so log to the base 2, 2 is 1. So k becomes log n. Whenever you are doing multiply, ah, yes, here, I, if you are, okay, let's say it is not i is equal to i star 2. It's i is equal to i into 4. Still, can I write log n? Yes, you can still write log n. Why? Because the base you are making instead of 2 becomes base 4. Okay, so whenever you are doing multiplication or division operators at incremental point, because you are reducing half of your work, that's why you will say input not n, n2, which is half. So I am saying instead of log n, I am working on log n. Okay. Yes, if you have i star 4 also, what happens? Your will be log 4 to base k. Okay, so you become 4. Okay. What about, very good question here. So you have this as part of your exercise. Now what happens is, now someone says, i is equal to n by 2. That is your initialization of There we are not going to consider it as logarithmic because we are, it is a condition check and the time taken for that is only 1. Okay. So let's see that with example. That, let's see that with example. Okay, so I think rules are clear, but you might have still questions. Log, logarithmic, don't worry, we'll just have the discussion for a minute. Okay, okay. just come up with what is the time taken for this problem. I request people to please, uh, uh, please try to do on paper and pen and just put the answer in. Okay, when you have a valid question, what you are saying is, let's say instead of i is equal to i star 2, you are saying i is equal to i into 4. Great. Your increment is happening by four times. Yes, you're saying my increment is happening. So what happens in your case is you will be saying at step k, uh, at n step or at the k step, it will be 4 to the power of k is equal to n. And your base will not be 2, your base will be 4 here. Why? Because you're incrementing by every iteration of four steps. You're jumping four elements. So that's all. Anything, let it be i into 4, i into 3, i into anything is the same. Someone has given me answer as order of uh, n square n square log n square log n is someone has given uh, someone has given n cube. Someone has given n n by 2 plus n by 2 log n, okay, n square, someone has given n square log n, okay. 
So great, I am getting good answers. So let us try to look at what are the answers and then we will try to uh, have a discussion. Okay. How many times is the first loop running here? How many times is the first loop running here? Actually, it is n by 2 times. You are correct. The first loop is running n by 2 times. For easier understanding, you say it is running for some n time. Now, people will get confused. n by 2 and n times are two different things. Yes or no? They are two different. But why should I still consider it as n rather than n by 2 times? What happens is n is an input size. Okay, n is an input size and by 2 is a constant operator. So, okay, that's why you can see n by 2 or n. That is not going to affect you. So, let's take. Now, next. How many times is the in this loop is running? The loop, internal loop is also running n by 2 times or n times. That's absolutely correct. n times I'm taking just for easier references. So, don't worry. I correct to, uh, correct type of uh, iterations is n by 2. Now, how many times is the internal, the for loop is running is log n times. Log n times, right? Now let's see the equation. See outer loop two times. So just do a simple multiplication. N into n is n squared into log n. Got it? So that's the reason why it is n squared log. Now those people who have written n plus n plus log n and they have would have written order of n. Why it is wrong? Let's have a look. Someone would have also got this in thought. Sir, my answer is n plus or n plus n plus log n. Okay. Then they would have written answer as order of n. Yes or no? They would have answered it as order of n. So, okay. Let's take this equations one again before going to the middle loop. Please let me finish this. Someone would have asked that the outer loop is running for n times. The inner loop is running for n times. The, the last loop is running for log n times. So, they have mistake that n plus n plus log n. Correct? Assume. Now, this is your statement. What is your time complexity? You would have got the time complexity of order of n, right? That is wrong because, can you observe, this whole part is behaving like a single loop. You start first loop to the last. That's the reason why it is n squared, uh, sorry, n squared log n. Okay. Now, let me see some questions which were interesting. Okay. Why it is log n? For this last loop explanation, just take this example here. This is constant time operation. This is n time operation, right? And uh, so this is, just take this example here. This will make your data clear. Just go through the slide. It should be clear for you. So how many times at x step I am somewhere at 2 to the power of k to know what position. Okay, got it. That's the reason why we are talking about n square log n. Okay, got it. See, if you write log n for this, your answer is wrong. Even if you write n square, it is more wrong. Why? Because n square log n is greater than log n or n square. Okay. Now, now, this problem is similar, so I'm just skipping. This is self-explanatory. Huh. Say, what is the time complexity for problem 3 years? What is the time complexity for problem 3? There is a break statement. There is a break statement. Order of n. Yeah, you did yesterday, so I'm skipping the explanation. Those who have typed wrong, don't worry. Uh, just once I can go through the rules, you will be able to understand why it is. Uh, why? Because this for loop is going to run only once. That reason. So I explained this yesterday and just keep it. Now, very important. Uh, so we will not take break. We will try to finish this problem and then we will take break. Okay. How many people have tried to solve the problem? Just it. You got a correct answer or not is, the not, is not a question, but how many people have tried to solve? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I did. Hey, I'm not talking what is your answer. I'm just asking the question, did you try it or you just know? Okay, so I think people have tried. Most of the people know is fine. Don't worry. Okay, now let's take an example how to solve problem of this kind. 
I yeah, I I already told you I am not able to see the one who have actually raised their hands because uh, there are we have so many participants. I am again requesting please post their questions. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Just uh, uh, so let's see what I mean. The people who have tried. That was the time complexity they would have encountered. I'll ask that question later, but let's try to solve. See, recursions are the problems that you mostly encounter when you are trying to solve algorithm which divide and conquer method, right? With agree me, recursions are something like divide and conquer method. All the program actually have recursion. A merge sort is a simple example of a recursion. Pitch sort is a simple example of a recursion based program. Let's say, how did I get this? We are not going into that details because that itself is a different topic of time complexity calculation of recursion using a tree method. So that I will request since it's not part of silver, I don't want you to get in confusion. For if you someone gives you an equation into this format, how will I try to solve this? What I am going to teach you with the help of a recursion method. Okay. Now let's take this as a equation. What it tries to either my I will run 2t n minus 1 times, or else if my input is equal to 0, it will just run with a constant time 1. That's what, what the program says. Either I will run, else I will just exit in 1 time. For example, if the input size is 1, divide and conquer cannot run. So you will be giving output in 1. So that's the case. When the input size is uh, greater than, or I should say greater than 1, but greater than 0, why we take it. No input and then input with one. Okay, so my program is going to run with two t n minus one minus one condition. If there is an input and if there is no input, it's just going to run in one. Now how do I? You know whatever I have seen are little different. There I could have simply written order of n or order of n square or something I was able to. But in this case, if it is a recursion base, you cannot use the generic rules what we have learned till. The method that we use is called a method called substitutional method. Okay, the method that we are going to learn is substitutional method. Solve the function with the substitution method, and this is only done when it is a recursion-based program. Okay, so now look at this. What is substitutional method? What is the value of t of n as per you? What is the value of t of n per you? No, no, it's not n factor. It's not n square. No, don't worry. That's what else. So recursion based methods, the equation, they will be always coming in condition, either this or that. Okay. See so the n, the t of n is one condition is either one, and the other condition which is two t minus one minus one. So this statement will execute when it is true. When recursion is happening, this statement will execute when there is no recursion. So this we call it as base condition. Okay, let's start. T of n is always the base condition. You see, this is T of n minus 1 minus 1. Yes, now substitutional method, T of n should be substituted. If it is T of n, what is here? 2T n minus 1 minus 1. But what is this? This is T of n minus 1. You are getting my point? T of n minus 1. This is T of n minus 1, right? Now, when you do substitution, you have to do substitution for all this statement, that is t of n minus 1, not for t of n. Right? Got it? So, where I am going to do the substitution, you are able to understand t of n minus 1. If I have t of n, I simply write 2t n minus 1 minus 1. In a substitution method, always you should try to substitute t of t. Do I have t of t here? Do I have t of t here? No, I have t of n minus 1. So let's try to substitute. What will be the value of t of n minus 1? Any guess? This is actually your 10th class match here, I know. It's been years and years people have not done. So you might find it difficulty, but just there you'll be able to understand it easily. So t of n minus 1, I'm substituting with yes. I have the correct answer. That is t of n minus 2. Great, I got the answer. Let me close this. Okay, so uh -oh. so this is what the substitution I did. So the substitution is not two of t. T you don't need to do because it no 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 need of t of t. It is two of t t n minus two minus one minus one here. 
okay which is minus 2 because second iteration so that's why you write minus 2 this is what you write 2 square t n minus 2 minus 2 minus 1 what is that you are going again try to substitute one more why i am substituting one more time is assume this tree based just simply assume it as a tree based at the first iteration if your input size is n at the second iteration divide and conquer what will be the number of iteration we are going to do let's answer this question first if at the first step you have given input here if the iteration is happening for second time how many left side you will have n by 2 right side you will have n by 2 yes or no would you agree for this or no and you are dividing root node if it is n left tree will be n by 2 right tree will be n by 2 you, do you agree with this Okay, one second, I'll mark that. Let's assume you are divide, doing a divide and conquer for some n. When you are dividing it for the first time, it will be n by 2. Again, it will be n by 2. Do you agree this? Yes. Again, if you are further dividing, n by 4, n by 4, n by 4, n by 4, right? This is the way how your division is happening. So, the recursion, every time you are going to substitute its the iterations, right? Now, now one more time you have to substitute t of n minus 1, which is, here it is t of n minus 2. So, it becomes t of n minus 3 substitution value for the equation. So, continue with all your substitution. And finally, you will encounter something like this equation. You are, whenever you are substituting, you keep on going on. Right? So, you say 2 power n of n minus n, something this way. And finally, you are able to reduce your equation with the expression. Okay. How did I got this? Where, which one you are having? This question. Right? You are having question like this. See, that's what I'm saying. In the substitutional method, you are going to substitute the iteration mark, which is t of n minus minus of 1, which is minus 2 here. Minus 1, minus 2. So don't worry. See, this you have to practice here. I'm sorry, I cannot explain the whole school match again. Okay, so that's the reason I'm just saying this is the method. And finally, you will get your address t of 1. Okay, don't worry. Time complexity will be taken. Okay. I think this was not an easy way to solve a problem when you do the recursion method. Every time you have to substitute, you are substituting a wrong value. What happens is, or my final answer might get wrong. Uh, see, Divya, we are not making assumption n plus 1 or there it will be n plus 1. Generally, when it is we assume that the division is happening equal. In reality, it might not happen, but making an assumption. If I got n values in recursion, one side it will be n by 2, other side also will have the same number of elements. May not be same. That's what I'm saying. If it is 1, what happens is you can even not run the loop. Okay? So don't worry with the recursion. This is how the recursion goes. We'll just take 5 minutes break. I think that recursion was little heavy on you, but Recursion is not part of the syllabus. We are working on master method. When there is a recursion, how to solve it in a simple way, we'll learn with master method. I just want to show you how complex is the recursion way. So what I have decided, uh, I did is, in the running notes, I have written very clear explanation about how I did this problem in this manner here. Okay? We'll, we are going on break for a minute. Just give me five minutes break. And then we'll start with master theorem method, which will take, uh, mostly 20 minutes, which is easy. I, 20 is too long time, which is easy. Then we'll just recollect uh, array stacks and queues. Okay.
Order of n by 2 is equal to order of log n. I told it accidentally. It was not. Order of n equal to order of log n. It is something if n is being divided by some factorial number, I can write it as log n. So order of log n. In, in that was my contest, but unfortunately, I spelled it as order of n by 2 is equal to order of log n. It's, it's a mistake because I have you have to write it as log n. Okay? Right. Uh, so, uh, Arul, how does this equation get is a completely different topic which I didn't want to uh, incorporate and that is something called recursion proofs. I am not, uh, we are, that is not very important for our uh, course, so I am just keeping it a self-learning topic. Otherwise, uh, whatever are important for a person to be an algorithmic design, we are just focusing on that. So, okay. Let's, let's uh, just... Uh, Discuss about the master theorem. See, whenever you have a, a recursion based function, always writing the recursion or trying to solve the recursion based functions, substitution is a hectic topic or a hectic task. So, what people have done is they have developed a method called master theorem method where we will be focusing the function functions on a particular format. The format is if the t of n is in a format of a of t n by b plus f of n, you can directly use your master theorem method. What are the master theorem? See, just see. It's a method that is always used to analyze the time complexity for written function. And especially this is used in divide and conquer role. Whenever you find a recursion function in this particular form, that is t of n is equal to a t n by b plus f of n. A and B being one. Okay, so A and B are you can assume uh, are greater than greater than or equal to one. B uh, being greater than or equal to one and B being greater than or equal to one is the condition. If you find a equation in this prop in this format, you directly use master theorem. Before I use master theorem, are there any cases in master theorem? Yes, a master a theorem comes with three cases and we will see each case one by one and how to use them and now we'll so uh, so i could not get what is t of b of n oh, this is not needed i forgot uh, okay whenever you are get in this format, you directly, whenever you find a recursion question in this particular format, you can directly uh, implement the the master theorem. Let's see. What is n? It is none other than the current size of the problem. A, the number of problems in recursion, n by b. See, this n by b total together, n and b are, so the n by b is the sub size, the size of each sub problem. Okay. So now what happens is, let's say, let me make the notation for a minute so that you can be clear. Okay? See, when you have problem, put the initial input. This is n. That's the size of the complete problem. When you do division, every time the size of the problem, for sub problems, upon reducing. At one iteration, it is n by 2. For some other direction, it is n by 2. For some iteration, it is n by h so or so the whole that n by b is the sub problem totally. This the size. So n is your total by the b that is the iteration. N, okay, so n by b is the size of the each sub problem. I think you are clear now. F of n is the cost of the work that has to be done outside the recursion. What is f of n to be done outside the recursion is when you do the recursion completely and you try to merge or you try to merge each problem together to get the final output, that is the f of n, which is not part of the recursion. Right? That is the cost of dividing or the cost of the merging is called as f of n. Is that clear or any confusion? Yeah, so you are clear. If you find equation in this form, yeah, we'll do with three examples. No, not one yet. I'm going to do the third example. I know it's, it's not that easy to have. What is the problem? Okay, 
Now let's say divide and conquer short. In quick short, array sorting all elements is problem, right? Yes. Yeah. Now in quick short, you are going to a pivot value wire to divide divide uh, divide the equation. Uh, one minute. Using the pivot value to divide your problem into two halves. So the first half can be said as a sub problem. The second can be said as a the next sub problem. Okay. Uh, is my voice getting seriously clear? Now is it clear? Uh, is my oh, okay? Okay, I just stopped and okay. Both my video and audio are breaking. Okay, just give me a second. Once I'll unmute and mute here. Now is the voice clear? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so you are clear with the terminologies that what a what is uh, how someone had a question. Now, of these a is not the size here. A is the the number of sub problems in the recursion. What is the number of sub problems? Eh? Now when you are dividing C by 4, N by 8, all the divide is 1. So those total number of divisions that you are doing is the number of sub problems. Okay, what the problem? Okay, good. Divide and con okay. Mm, very good. Okay, just one second. Quick shot. I'll just talk about quick shot. If you are not understood, don't worry. Now in quick shot, we are trying to arrange the elements in a sorted order, right? We are doing this method. We try to divide divide the problem into half and solve them. When we are dividing, I get a pivot value and I divide into two. Half. The first half can be called subpro. The second half can be called a subpro. That is what we call it as a subpro. Now again, you divide it further. That is one more subpro. You divide it further. That is other subpro. The portion of the original problem which you are solving in that iteration is called problem. I think that should be clear now. Okay. Now let me continue. Okay. Now, so f of n I have told you that is uh, the time taken which is outside the recursion problem, like dividing operation or merging operations. Right? Okay. See, so this is none other than the time taken at the instance. Okay. Now see, I told you master theorem comes with three cases. And when which has to be used is dependent when uh, will will be discussed a little bit later. Let's try to look at three cases. Now, when you have a tree, what are the elements that a tree has? Same. We have a tree. What are the elements a tree will have? It's a notes good. Edges great. Leaves great. Okay. Yes, great. Root what's leaf. Perfect. Perfect. The, the, that's pretty. Uh, some people can say root, edge, uh, nodes, and nodes also someone can say leaf node, intermediate node. So basically, if you see, majorly I have a root, I have a leaf, I have uh, leaves or uh, uh, nodes together, leaf in the sense I'm talking about one category, the bottom most nodes I think that's leaf, and I have edges to connect them. That's all. Okay, branches and so on. Okay. Uh, Five minutes, okay, so we'll just move on. Don't worry. I have to just talk about these conditions and we'll move to the problem. Okay. Now these are the three cases. Now if my problem is completely dominating at the leaf node. Matla, I'm getting the solution at the leaf node. I'll be using the case one. How do I get to know? Do not worry for instance, that will come when we are the problem. If my problem is equally distributed throughout the tree, every iteration is performing as equal, then I will be using k2. K2 is the two number. If my problem is dominant at the root, I mean at the initial state without any division, I will be using some 
called as case. What are these? Just let me read the cases. If you observe each case, the final output you are getting is an average case notation, T of T, theta. See, worst case, if my program is running all the way till the leaf, all the way till the bottom, it means my complete all sub nodes are running. That's why it is worst case, the, the go notation. If my problem is equally distributed, that's the average case. Anytime this is going to behave the same. The moment I give input and I'm getting output, the best case is working. That's why if you see, each case is talking about a situation big O, omega, and theta. So all subloops are running in the worst case program. So for that, each we have got three conditions. This three condition I'll talk when with an extra. But only remember one thing, that we're doing the case three, should always check for something called regularity condition that I'll discuss at the time of example. Okay. See internal nodes, external nodes, no. Leave nodes, the bottom most nodes. When we are talking about case to all the nodes, which include leaf and root and everything there. Okay. Right. Let me go with an example how to apply the theorem, then we will come back because I think it was too much theory for the point now. Now, what are the factors that we have seen in the equation? I have got A, I have got B, I have got F of N, I have got something called N by B. If you see any point, we have not N in different. N is equal to total input. That is T of N, right? Now, if you see, I have got A value, I have got B value, I have got F of N values. Yes, I have got three values for a means just again going back for the Equation. How is this equation looking? Please do look at. I have got A separate. I have got N by B value. I have got F of N, right? These are the values what I am going to have in my equation. So first step that I do also is expect A value, B value, and F of N value for a given direction. Okay. Now after you have uh, uh, extracted each value, what should I? Do? You are going to substitute. You are going to determine something called as n log a to the base b. Okay, n log a, uh, a to the base b is what an issue is. Uh, you are supposed to determine. How do I determine this? Basically, uh, you are going to substitute the value a, value a and value b into the determine into the determined n log a by b. That's the way how we are going to determine n log a by b. Apart from that, I have got f of n. Now I have got a determined value called n log a by b. I am going to compare these two values. When I compare, what are my cases? Is I can encounter equal case, I can encounter greater than case, or I can encounter lesser than case. These are the three cases. What I when I do compare, either my value will be or it will be greater or it will be less. Based upon your e plus or greater condition, you implement. One of the three cases. Now, if it is equal, you will be always applying the condition second case here. Okay, when it is equal, you will be applying the case two. Okay, when it is uh, when it is less than, you will be applying case one, and when it is greater, you will be applying case three. I think just heard something randomly saying like three cases. If equal, you are case two. If it is less, you are saying case one. If greater, you are saying case three. But with what? You will always compare f n to n log a to the base b r. Okay, let's try to do the problem. And if you're not able to understand, we'll stop with one case. Try to understand it much clear. Then we'll go to the two other cases. Right? Okay, let me go to them so that theory concept will be more clearly understood. Right? Okay. Now, first question. Is this in the format of a to the a t n by b plus f of n? Can you say this is in the form of a or uh, a of t of n by b plus f of n? Can you say this problem? Is, so can I use master theorem? Can I use master theorem? Yeah. Okay. Now, step. What should I do in the first step? What should, what I'm supposed extract a value, b value, and f of n value. A value, B value, and F. What is A value here? Two. What is B value? Two. B value is two. And what is the value of F of F of N is equal to N. Three values you extract. Now let's try to solve. Did I explain it? Correct. Great. Now what is the second? 
determine something. What is that? Enough of A to the base B should be determined. Right. How do I determine that? Just substitute the values of A or A and B in the formula and of log A to the base B. Did you determine this? Which is n log 2 to the base 2 is 1. Uh, and so n power 1 is equal to n. Correct? Did you determine this or no? Yes, great. Now what is the third step? Comparison between f of n and the determined value. Okay. Okay. So let me uh, let me get on a little bit slow. It goes to the step number two. Is the step number two clear? Is the step number two clear? No. Okay. Great. Okay. If it's not, no. I'll just explain. So step number one, what I did, extracted value A, I extracted value B, I extracted F of N. Three values I extracted. The step number two, let's take, make an assumption there is a predefined formula which says n log a by b. Okay, that's there. Now I have to determine n log a by b. How do I determine? I by substitute the value of a and b in that formula. So I have substituted the value a and b in the formula n log a by b. I did. So when n log 2 to the base 2 is always 1, so I have received n by 1 is equal to n by 1. Got it. Yes, okay. Uh, see, uh, whenever, okay, there is a very important question. How do I know that 2 of n is equal to the n by 2 plus n? It's always a given statement. Someone says the function is in this format. So for those who are going to work. Oh, log base 1 is undefined here. Yeah? Okay. So let me tell step 2 people are clear, I hope. So. Let me go to the step number. What is step number 3? Is I am going to compare between f of n and the determined value n log a to the base b. Yes or no? The step number 3, comparison between f of n and n log a to the base b, which is a determined value. If I compare, see, remember, please, the comparison is always done between f of n to n log a by b here, right? So what is the comparison that you are going to get here? What is the comparison here? n equal to n, you can say this two comparison is going to equal. Now got it. Till this step, everyone should be okay. I guess a simple extraction, substitution and comparison. There is no doubt. And when you compare, you understood that the values are equal. No, here we have problems where they are not equal. Don't worry. I'm just trying to make you understand it with easier problem first, then we'll go for a little difficult. Now, the equation is we are saying this is equal. Now, I have got how many rules in master theorem or how many cases in the master theorem I have got? Total three cases. The first case, second case, third case. Now, when it is equal, what it means to say is just for simple understanding, remember, the upper bound and lower bound both are closely tightly associated. So can I say this is case number two? Can I say this is case number two? Yes. Case two here. So, okay, one because case three, if someone has written, just forget for a minute. Let's one second go back to this case. See, tightly bounded, tightly. Okay, equal, which means tightly. The upper and no, just that's an assumption that in any case, outer function and inner function both are happening at the same time complexity. So let's take it. The upper function is the outer function f of a, and the internal function is the t of uh, the equation. So that's the way you make an assumption, OK? So case two. Now let's try to solve the problem. We decided we are going to use the case two. Okay. Now, what is case two? So I'll just request you people to note the case to for a minute here, so that we don't have a confusion for the instance. Just note down the t of n equal to the statement. Just the theta of n log a b log n. Just that condition I want you to note down. Okay? Hope you would have uh, noted now. 
can i go back to the problem please yeah now if you see just what i do is i sub f of n is equal to theta of n right because t of n because if this is what i have to substitute see f of n is equal to theta of n log d by a B's value is 1, A's value is 1, uh, sorry, A's value is 2, B's value is 2, so it becomes, F of n becomes theta of, theta of n, right? Theta of n, that's why it becomes theta of n. Now, T of n is equal to theta of n log A by B. So, what will be the time complexity of T of n now? It will become n log n, right? So, the time complexity to solve this problem is theta of n log n. Now, people have a lot of questions. Why it is case 2? Why it is case 2? Right? When you have got a function, when you are able to get a value which is so close to that function, not so close, it's equal to function, what it means is the upper bound and the lower bound. It means externally you are not able to find a value that is going to prove there exists some other equation which is greater than f of n or less than f of n. That's why you take case to here. Theta condition. Is that clear? Okay. So, Pavan has a question. Why can't I take, okay. Why can't I take my time complexity as uh, n? See, n log n is always greater than n. If you write theta of n, the worst case is theta of n log n. That's why you take theta of n log n as your time complexity. Okay. What is theta condition? Here I am again requesting people please go through the videos in the recording session about the time complexity. Theta is time complexity when you are able to find an average condition. So what is average condition? Is? Let's say f of n is a equation. Your time taken to perform. You are trying to identify does there exist some value which is going to perform more than f of n or less than f of n. But here if you even substitute external condition that is a log a by b which was not pure, that's an external. Even they're saying that I am not able to find any equation that is greater or less or equal. So it should be average case. Got it? That's the reason why you get average case. The mind value n log a by b is an external condition. We are trying to prove I might get a function greater or less. Is this clear? Can I go to the next one more example? Okay, I can go. Thank you. Okay, great. Now let's discuss about this, this point I am just uh, Arun, I'm really sorry at this voice. I got break. I don't know. Uh, just for your case, uh, once again, I'm unmuting and... Um, okay. Uh, so, I'm really sorry if the voice is breaking this uh, Because I'm delivering from Hyderabad campus, I think there might be a bandwidth issue. So, next session, I'm sure I'll make that there will be no bandwidth issues from wherever I'm delivering. I'm really sorry. Uh, I think I can do. For your case... Can I uh, close the video? Because last two cases are only the problem solving. Okay, I'll just close the video so that uh, we can... So now... Uh, so I think you're not able to see my video, right? Okay, fine. So, okay. Now, for these two problems, you'll be only able to, uh, audio only, yes, I have intentionally closed my video because a lot of people were getting breakage, just going for audio only. Now, let's uh, try to solve this problem. Uh, half of the problem is solved. Now, try to say what comparison you are going to get, greater or less than or equal to. Always remember, you are going to compare between f of n, to n a by b r. Just once again, think and answer here. Yeah. How is your comparison happening? f of n to n log a by b. Please remember, you are always going to compare. One second, give me a give me a second. I'll just put the notator. 
your comparison should be always between f of a to n log a by b, not n log a by b to f of n. So please, now you say, is it greater or less than? Now you say it's greater or less than, yes? Yeah? So let how n is greater than n squared. I just have a simple question. Is n greater than n squared? No, no. n is less than n squared, right? So always remember, if n is less than n squared, the comparison operator is, here it is less than n. Yeah, f of n. Just please focus with respect to f of n. So f of n compares to n log n. So what, what is my output here? It is f of n is less than n squared. Got it? Now which case? They go from case two, case three. See when it is than, we are going to go with case one. Less than always case one, which is omega condition. So let's back, back quickly once uh, once again to see which case what is case one. Let's see what it says is the case one. Just write down the case one for a minute. Those who have thought about case three will have a discussion. Those who have thought about case one also will have just for a minute. Note down the case one for a step. The f of n completely and d of n complete. I think you have note down, so can I go to this problem like, okay, great. Now, let's say someone has decided I am going on case number three. What happens is just meeting. Now, your f of n is your function, right? f of n is your function. Now, you, what is the external function that you are discussing is n log a by b, yes? Is that an external function? You are saying there is a function which is greater than n squared. Mean there exists a work case than f of n. So f of n is not the worst. So that's why we are talking about less than. f of n is less than n squared. It means n square n has an upper boundary n squared. That's why we say case 1. That's clear now? Those who have choose case 3? Okay. You are saying that this is the upper boundary. So I choose the case 1. Got it? So now let's try to substitute. Show me the answer. I have asked you to copy and say me the answer here. So let's see whether it is. Theta of n squared. Got it? Okay. Got it? It's theta of n squared. Right? You got the solution for I now which came. Now I go with the question number three. Okay, where? Oh, sorry. I don't know. Okay, very good question. Uh, Varma has a very good question. If you observe clearly, we are writing almost our cases in theta notation. See, in mass theorem, we try to represent always our n complexity in average case only. That is only with master theorem. Okay, uh, see what it happens, epsilon value, some value which I don't know. So that's what, epsilon value is something that is not known. Okay, so that, so our time complexity is always P of n. F of n is the external function. There is some external function time taking happening to perform is order of n square or less than order of n square. Got it? So F of n when saying, that's the substitution here. So that's why, just one second. Here, you remember the equation. So here, you have that substitution value. Okay? So point number four again for example. So do you want me to explain the problem, uh, point number four? No, ellipse is not negative. What we are trying to say here is time taken to perform outside the recursion is f of n. Okay? 
which says the time taken to perform option out of recursion might take order of n square less than order of n square because 2 minus epsilon. What is the epsilon value? If it, someone says equal to 1, if epsilon is equal to 1, then I will say the time taken to perform outside operation is the order of n only. Uh, see, uh, I have a question for frac fraction of n. Master theorem will be only, will not be solving all the question problems here. Why? We will see with the example number 3. See, master is not a solution for all recursion problems. If you are not able to find a solution in master theorem, especially with S3, you have to use the substitution method. Okay, someone is asking step number 2. Okay. So, when wh what is the question you have with step number 2? Can you please do this time? I hear people match here when uh, 9 is divided by 3, 3 2s are 9. So, log 9 by 3 is another than n square operation. So, it becomes n square. There are a lot of, okay. So for answering this kind of questions, you have something called logarithmic table. Just you can go to log n by 9 by 3 will be, it will directly write in that log. You can just Google and you can get those here. Logarithmic calculations. There are predefined people have done a uh, lot of proofs and concepts why it is square. Simple. 3 uh, with 9 can be divided by 3 and with factor of 2. Okay. So let me go with the next example. Okay. Now, when I, before explaining example number 3, let's work on case number 3 once, uh, once before we go to uh, the problem here. So I'm going to case 3 once and we'll just finish it quickly. Now, can people read the case 3 once, the third uh, master theory case? Anyone can read master theory case 1? Oh, sorry, case 3. Uh, case you can go through here. You can go through the logarithmic form. Okay. So, logarithmic value is a lot of little school marks which we can't keep on solving. That might take too much time in finishing this uh, syllabus here. Okay. I think we have read the case. So, what happens in the case? Uh, see, what happens in case is it's very similar to case 3, but the epsilon value is uh, positive. Okay, it's not the condition. Whenever you are getting theta of f of n, you should check for something called as regularity. What regularity condition is? Just look at this. If a of f of n by b should be always less than or equal to c of f of n, where c being a constant value and it could be less than 1. If you are able to prove and if this condition is satisfying, this will be satisfied when your equation is a polynomial equation. Then only you can implement the master theorem for case 3. Otherwise, none of the master theorem can be applied. None in the sense when the condition is case 3. Before case 3 apply, you should always check for a regularity condition. Regularity condition A of F of N by B should be always smaller than some constant value which is multiplying to your external condition. If that holds true, then only K3 will be implemented. Let's try to quickly solve the problem. And constant value is always less than 1. Okay? Remember, it should not be less than or equal to 1. It should be always less than 1. Okay. Now, step number 1 is determining A, B. Is this clear? And F of N? Step number one, we are just doing. So, till step number three, I'm just quickly showing up. Then we'll discuss about the rest. Okay. Huh. Till here, you are okay. It's greater. F of n is greater than n log 3 by 4. See, n log 3 by 4 is... Uh, n, log, uh, n log 3 by 4, we assume it is less than 1 in our condition. Okay. See, uh, you have a very valid question. Someone says, do I do to check regularity condition in case 1 and case 2? No. You don't need to check regularity condition in case 1 and case 2. Why? Because case 1 and case 2 are talking about the worst case and the average case. But case 2 is the one which is talking about best case 
equation. You are trying to say there is no equation, which external equation, which is smaller than this. If there exists, you have to prove, uh, you have, you cannot implement the case three. For case one and case three, you don't have any regularity condition. Is this clear? It's greater. So I'm going to use case three. So just simply substitute the values. Before case three, sorry. Uh, case three, you have to check for the regularity condition. The regularity condition is A of F of N by B less than or equal to C of F of N, where C is less than one. Okay, just check your regularity condition. If you you are finding if C is equal to three by four, just randomly you took three by four is less than one, you are able to find C of N is less than sorry, C of F of N is greater than your N of log A by B. So once it is proven, then simply substitute and you will get your answer only when it's satisfied. Okay. Now let me go for questions here. There are a lot of questions. Okay. There is something called a concept called master theorem correct. Uh, there they have described why epsilon is used and why epsilon is not used. Yes, you are given marks for the steps. Don't worry. Yeah. Uh, master theorem, you will be able to implement the most easily because in, there will be no question asked in such a way that find the recursive. It will be for this following recursion function. Please try to uh, please write the time complex. That's the way all the questions will be. It will be not given example. I a recursion problem and ask you to find the recursion equation. Yeah, that's a long time taking process, okay? But still you have to read about the tree recursion method. Thanks. Uh, so any other questions you have? Okay, why you have to check for the regularity condition? Okay. So the regularity condition is checked to ensure that there is no external case that is going to run faster uh, than, or, or uh, there is no condition, the internal condition is not running faster than the external condition. For that, we will be checking always regular. Uh, have any people have seen the sample questions in the uh, sample question papers in the Takshila? So those, that is my page, last year page. So you just can expect will be the question paper that I'm going to set. Okay, so that's the way how generally I said the paper. So coming to the end of arrays and uh, uh, I'll not, we'll hold, this is Sunday, so I'll not extend the lecture till one. So I'm going to stop. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I might have given a lot of theory. But, uh, that's the way how we will start learning now. Once the next class theory will end, from then we'll be most implementing more algorithms that time you will have more and more pressure okay uh, but uh, still it's little theory based sessions you have to bear one more uh, so you will have this lecture, uh, lecture notes ready by Tuesday yes. okay Tuesday you will have uh, see we have edit is not today Every 10 minutes so start ADD we'll discuss ADD in the next lecture uh, uh, no, no, see, Pavan, lecture notes is only to understand slides here. You you have always the freedom to read textbooks. Okay, next lectures we will be covering ADGs. If time permits, we will start with introduction of trees here. Okay, right. Uh, any more questions or can I end the session? Quick, quick. Just one second. I have a question someone has posted. So let me see if the regularity conditions fail. What I need to do if the regularity conditions fail, the recursion theorem has to prove only by substitution method. You cannot prove it by any more by master theorem. Prove no, you cannot find the time complexity using master theorem. You have to prove, uh, solve it using only the recursion method. 